Come one, come all, number lovers, because we got you covered today. When to pay off debt fast and when to invest. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. So often we get this question, hey, should I pay this off? Should I invest? Should and we give you all kinds of rules of thumbs, and we give you all kinds of sayings, and we give you all kinds of uh, you know, guidelines, little tricks and guidelines. Benchmarks. Today is about the numbers. Today is about actually putting the rubber to the road to say when should I, when shouldn't I, and why does it matter? It, it, look, I love that we have diversified. We, we started off as a podcast. We moved into YouTube. But this thing, dirty little secret, it has turned into the, the YouTube comments has turned into something that kind of occupies... <laughs> A little, a big portion of this brain. It's your version of social media now. And you debt crusaders, I mean, y'all think all debt just bad, bad debt. <laughs> and and I try to give you some logic, and you're like, nope, nope. And then I'm like, you know what? We need to give them some numbers. Let's do they it. They need to go to see some numbers, because you can't argue with the numbers. So let's kind of load them up with, with how this is. Because here's the thing about debt. Debt is one of those things where it... I always tell people, you have to think about it as a dangerous tool. Yeah. It can be a knife. It can be a chainsaw. It depends upon really how scared you need to be with this, this tool that's in there. Because, and here's why debt is so important is because debt has a, a profound impact on your credit score. Mm-hmm. And credit scores, uh, you know, that, that's what's going to cut your insurance yep. premium rates. That's what's going to talk about, you know, how much you can afford to buy big life purchases yep. in the future. Like, are you going to be able to get that car? Are you going to be able to get that future house? Are you going to be able to get your utilities approved? Right. I mean, it's amazing what happens. So, like I said, I know you guys think that we are just totally just whipping on this dead horse right now because our comments section has been alive with all you guys. Just like, debt stinks. Get it the heck out of here. But here's what I know. These are binary people that think everything's black and white. That's right. I know the older I get, the more I figure out the world's pretty daggum gray. Well, let's make sure I heard that. The, the older you get, the grayer you get. Is that what I just heard? I am getting a little gray. I mean, look at this. I'm not. A, I'm not a silver fox completely. Not yet. Not yet. But I am realizing there's a lot of gray. And then what? What? What happens when you understand? how the financial world works, you know, there's a lot of things pulling on your wallet. That cash flow that comes into your wallet monthly, there's lots of things pulling on there. It's, um, it's, you know, it's not all debt, yeah. but the yeah. portion that is debt, some debt is more punitive than other debt. That's right. So you, the, you can't treat everything as the same. And then don't forget that you need to be saving for the future. That 15 to 20% that needs to be saving for the future and emergency reserves, there's a lot of things pulling on you. And, so we want to adjust it. And I think one thing that's really interesting, Brian, you just said this, you know, not all debt is the same. Believe it or not, and if you've listened to us for any, any amount of time, you know this, not all dollars that you save towards your army of dollar bills are the same. Yeah. Some of them can do a lot more for your army than others. And you have to kind of understand that so that you can make really wise decisions around how you approach debt. So if you are an analytical person or you just want somebody to put this conversation to bed, Here's what we're going to cover today on whether so you can make better decisions on when you should accelerate paying off debt fast versus let that army of dollar bills work for you. We'll be covering credit card debt. Yep, big we're one. going to be covering student loan debt. Oh, really? Because you guys days. give me lots of feedback yep. on that. We're going to be talking about automotive loans and yep. debts on vehicles, and then the last one, of course, mortgage debt. And I can't wait to load you guys up with some data on that one. Love it. So let's kind of let's just jump into this thing, Bo. Let's talk about credit card debt. Credit card debt. So this is the thing. I think this is a binary decision. We are not one of these financial people, that, you know, personalities out there that says all credit card debt or credit card use is bad. Right. I do agree because there's some people that we think a lot of that are anti all credit cards. Yep. And I completely agree with them. We are consolidated and on the same page that credit card debt is horrible. Yep. You should not have any credit card debt. It is official no-go zones because think about this. The interest rate, the average interest rate. What was funny is when we did show prep on this, I had intern Daniel. I said, I know because I just did this recently. The average interest rate is 17.3% on credit cards. Right. And then Daniel's creating these great 
you know, you know, slides yeah, now. Yeah. And I, when, I, when we went in there and looked at it, I said, 1776? And he goes, yep, they just updated it. It's gone up. And then Austin, who's also one of our interns, goes, did you see the, did you see the number? And I was like, oh my gosh. Only in America is the average interest rate 1776. <laughs> we just made it through July 4th. And that's horrible. I mean, that really is. If you think about what's punitive is, is, is seeing that when people pick on me about a 10% rate of return with the S&P 500, right. if, but they probably, because I know there's about 70% of the population that will tell you they don't have credit card debt, but they really are carrying balances. Right. When you see that they might be paying 17.76%, how do you ever get out away from that? But don't, don't take our word for it, because again, we wanted to actually put numbers to it. We wanted to have some metrics on there. So what we said is that Credit card debt is bad. Credit card use is not necessarily bad. That's the line of the sand well, that we're drawing. Here's why. Before you pull up the slide on the numbers, I, I, I was like, my, my listenership needs some type of guidance to know what I'm talking about here. And, and here's what I came up with. Back in the 90s, there was a song that came out by Warren G. Okay. Called Regulators. Oh, uh, mount up. And it had a quote or a little clip at the beginning from Young Guns. And it was a great quote. I loved it. When I was in, that's right. It uh -huh. closed off with Mount Up. But here's what the, it starts off. It says, can't be any geek off the street. Got to be handy with the steel. <laughs> and here's the thing you need to know about credit card debt. If you're not disciplined, if you're not the best of the best with your money management, you can't use credit cards. Yep. You have to pay credit cards off every month. Yep. If you're not good with the steel, it ain't be no geek just off the street. You can't use credit cards. That's what the song, that's what the, if you want to apply this to the Warren G song and Nate Dogg, I love it. we are talking about the fact that not anybody can use credit cards. You have Perfect. to be the best of the best with your money. I yeah. know there's a lot of you guys out there in the Money Guy family. You get it. You can use all the buying resources, the extended warranties, the price match, just the convenience of credit cards. But there's a whole other group of the population. Just stay the heck away from it. That's right. And let's talk about why you got to stay away if you can't pay it off. Yeah, so we thought it'd be really interesting to look at uh, an illustration of what this could look like. And so, Brian, we found that uh, the average credit card balance in this country was a little over $6,300. That's true, right? true. Uh, we know that the average annual percentage rate... A lot of people that have more than that, though. They're, they're looking at 6300 but I I'll wish my that. debt was 6300 because they got... $10,000, $20,000, $30,000 of debt. Uh, and we know that the average uh, interest rate is 17.76%. Well, here's what credit cards will allow you to do. They don't, they don't make you pay them off monthly. They'll give you the option to pay less than that amount. Mm -hmm. Hey, don't worry. Just give us $25 or 3% of your outstanding Whichever is greater. Whichever one's greater. So we said, oh, someone operated under that assumption and they bought a $6,300 thing and they put it on a credit card and they only paid the minimum amount, either $25 or 3%, whichever one's greater. How long would it take for them to pay off that? Purchase? I was shocked. But I realized we were nice to the credit card companies because we actually use 3% because that's one of the things got into the bank rate. I know there's other books out there in the personal finance space that have done the same analysis, but they use 2% mm -hmm. as the, the required minimum payment yep. on, on their credit card. But you can see using 3% and being generous to the credit card company or to you, the credit card holder, it took almost 15 years. It was 176 months to actually pay off the credit card debt. That, that thing that you bought that only should have cost you $6,358 ends up costing you over $12 thousand dollars almost doubles the price of that purchase and if you want to be disgusted like i said other financial people have talked about using two percent because there are credit cards that have used two percent as their minimum payments it would take you over 22 years to pay it off so the question is okay when does it make sense to prioritize paying off credit card debt always always if you have high interest punitive debt get that knocked out from the gate a1 start there get rid of it only people that can use credit cards are regulators that can mount up if you can't pay off your credit card every month just it's no go you can't do it and here's something just to keep in the back of your mind when chris hogan did that research on millionaires with dave ramsey 73 percent of millionaires do not have credit card debt I never had it. a struggle and look we work with a lot of very successful people how many people that come in as prospects, they're, they're telling us about all their credit card debt? You just don't see it. You don't see it. That's right. So if you struggle with credit card debt, 
this is your first probably indication that discipline and just being good with money is a struggle for you. You got to get that financial household order, you know, in order before, so you can move to the next step of being successful in wealth building. Okay, Brian. So there's a whole camp of people that says, hey, Brian, that's not me. I know that I don't need credit card debt. I know that I don't need to go rack up consumer debt. But I also know that I should invest in myself. Invest so, in yourself. Man, that is a great thing that has reached into the soul of America and has driven up a lot of student loan that's debt. That's exactly right. And here's it. I want you guys to know. I think education, I love, I think everybody out there, and this is something I try to pass on. You know, when you become an intern or you start working here, what do we do, Bo? We load them up with we a lot of books. books. We, we give them some books. We give them a lot uh, of books. I don't want to call it required reading material, but it is highly encouraged reading material. I about. want you to be a student of life. That's why we have, this is our virtual classroom. Yep. So you should be investing in yourself, but there's two bad trends that are totally destroying what used to be, I used to call student loans good debt. It mm -hmm. was kind of like mortgage debt, student loans. They were both in that good debt column because you were investing in yeah, yourself. Yeah, it was an appreciating asset. Your education. But, but here's the two things that are totally ruining this. The rapid increase in cost of education. Yep. We did a slide recently where I went to UGA, you went to UGA, mm -hmm. intern Daniel graduated from UGA. Right. What I was shocked is... Every year, I mean, you, it's almost like a train schedule. You could set your clock to it. The University of Georgia has increased their tuition by 7% per year. Does bread go up at 7% a year? Nope. Do pay raises go up 7%? No, but Not somehow cost of education at University of Georgia, like clockwork, has been 7% per year. You can understand how the compounding is actually working against you that's when right. it comes to student debt. So that's very scary. The second thing is... And you guys have called me out on this because when I'm doing shows and I'm talking about student loan debt, and I've talked about historic low rates, you guys who have student loan debt are like, Brian, what are you talking about? What you talking about, Willis? I mean, that's, that's one of those things because you know that your student loan debt is probably like 6.8%. Right, yeah, yeah. And I had somebody in just two weeks ago that they had five student loans. And they did have a few that were like 3.8. Mm -hmm. And then they had a few that were in the fours and fives. And then they had like one that was 6.8%. Sure. And I was like, wow, there is a vast difference between a student loan that's at 6.8% and, and a 3.8% debt. I mean, those are night and day. So when I tell you on what you should prioritize on paying off versus investing, you have to think about it you differently. Have to, you have to, yeah. So we need a system. We right. need a system for our audience to kind of know because we also know, look, when you're in your 20s and 30s, you want to make sure you're investing in yourself by building an army of dollar bills right. that can grow. So you probably, now you're at this dilemma, like, do, do I pay off student loan debt? Do I invest in a yep. Roth IRA? The order of operations turns into a big question yep. mark. So we thought, okay, well, let's make a flow chart, right? Let's make a, a decision matrix around how do I approach knowing when do I build my army of dollar bills versus when do I pay off my student loans? Now, I love this because it let me and both, sh me and Bo show off in multiple ways. First, you get to flex and show that you got some fancy definitions that you know with your sure. CFA. Yep. Is that we try to come up with a system that said, okay, what is, we want to take into account that you're young. So remember the way we've always talked about our assumptions when we do these type of illustrations, 20-year-olds mm -hmm. should be swinging for the fences on risk, especially because they're dollar cost averaging. So even if we have volatility, volatility is actually a good thing Absolutely. for our 20 and 30-year-olds is because buying into down markets is great, but I think you can probably, even in down markets because you're buying into cheaper and cheaper, you could probably expect in the long term of looking at your saving career, you probably could, if you're thinking about the S&P 500, make around 10% yep, a year. I think that's reasonable. When you're in your 30s, you have to start dialing the risk down. Maybe you got kids, so it's 9%. Yep. By the time you reach your 40s, it's probably 8% because once again, you're adding more diversification, sure. taking a little more risk off the table. By the time you're in your 50s, it's, well... We'll get to that, but when you have student loan debt, it doesn't really come into play yeah. that much. So that's our number. And then, Bo, this is where the term equity risk premium, what is that? Yeah, so equity risk premium is essentially the additional return you get for taking on more risk in the financial market. So if you're someone out there who knows that you can go and get X percent risk-free, whether that's in cash or CDs treasuries. or something like that, treasuries, you can go get 2% risk-free. If you can go out and invest in something like, say, the S&P 500 and go get 6%, you would say that you have a 4% equity risk premium. So we said, okay, well, if we're going to give folks some rules of thumbs, 
we need to think about this because the the risk free rate changes over time, yep. right? So it's not always a four percent risk free rate. It's not always a two percent. But we were able to find on average that the risk free rate stays fairly consistent. It's somewhere between three and a half to five and a half percent. So sure. we went conservative. Yep. We did four percent. We did four percent. And so we said very easily, if you think about, you're someone who can make. 10% on your investments. In your 20s. In your 20s. And you have a risk-free rate of 4%. That means that your equity risk premium would be 6% above yep. that. So that's what, if you have student loan, if you're in your 20s and you have student loans that are charging you more than 6%, Yep. You probably want to focus a lot of your resources on paying that off That's early. That's exactly right. If you're in your 30s, because realize we dialed down that return just a little bit, yep. if you take the 9% minus the 4%, right. now if your student loan rates are greater than 5%, go attack those things. By the time you're in your 40s, it's probably around 4%. Yep. And you notice we stopped there. It's because... I don't want you to have, if you have student loans in your 50s, it's not we're good. doing this wrong. So you got to be out of student loan debt in your 50s because realize this, you get closer to financial independence. I want you debt free. I just want to make sure that while you're in your 20s and 30s and that army of dollar bills can grow significantly and work hard for you, that we take advantage of that. Absolutely. And don't, don't miss here. So we're not saying that you shouldn't invest in yourself. We're not saying that you shouldn't even go have student loans because some of us are in a position where maybe that's the only way that we're able to go out there and get a college education, get a degree. But if you are going to accumulate student loan debt, when you think about retiring that, you want to do it in the most efficient and effective way possible. And I think there is going to be some people who are watching this that are on the other side of it. I mean, they have not built up a lot of student loan. They're looking for guidance on that. Remember, we give the guidance that try to come out of college with your student loan debt being less than your first year's anticipated salary. That's right. Exactly right. If you can do that, that will keep you from choosing because it's just like I have a daughter that's probably going into something with the arts. Mm -hmm. And I've had a conversation. I said, is it going to bother you if you don't come out making great money? And she goes, no, I kind of understand that. So we're going to make sure that her portion of participation in student loan debt and other things, that it, she it doesn't sense. come out yeah. with greater debt than what she probably will make in That's her perfect. first year out of school. Yep. Let's talk about auto loans. Okay. Perfect one. I mean, I, if I have to have a car in most markets, if I want to get somewhere, if I want to go have a job, if I want to be a productive member of society, I got to have a vehicle, but maybe I'm young and I haven't figured out how to, you know, pay cash just yet. I got to borrow some money. Yep. So if I do, how do I know when and how and how to approach that? Here's what I think about is interesting about vehicles, Bo. When we go speak at high schools, what's the first, if not second, question we get asked? Well, what kind of car do you drive? What kind of what car, kind do, of you car drive? do you drive? Oh, you're financial advisors? You got to be like the rock on ballers, so, right? Uh, so that's the question that's asked. And it's true, you because there's all kinds of stereotypes. And then I can tell you when I was 15 or 16 years old, I was so nerdy. They used to daydream that 25 was the age that insurance rates went down. Okay. That's what you, you know, that's yeah, common that's lore is that you when hear. you turn 25, your insurance rates go go down for men. I was going to go buy a Corvette. Oh, of course. Because why Why wouldn't Reby, a 25 year old, do that? Now, when I hit 25, now I realize about the average age, by the way, for Corvette purchasers is actually in its 50s. <laughs> Isn't that sad? <laughs> but it's, um, but you know, because I think what happens is the same thing happened to me. I went, it was 16, that was a dream. Right. Turned 25, I was like, Corvette? Yeah. I got a family, you know, I got, you know, I got a wife. We're yeah, not buying yeah, yeah. a Corvette. So, but here's the thing I think is interesting. Since this is a status thing in society, somehow it's crept into the fabric of America that cars are status symbols. Right, That's yeah. a way for you to flex. Flex, yep. Yeah, but is it really a good use of money when this is the stat I found on carfax.com is roughly 20% of the value of a car just turns into vapor in the first year of ownership? It's it's sort of unbelievable. Outside of food, I was trying to think about something else that you purchase that just decreases in value so quickly. It probably had to be something like a boat or a camper. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's something, but cars are horrible uses of resources when you think about a fifth of their value just completely yep. disappears almost after you pull it off the That's parking right. lot. Yeah. So, you know, the ideal thing when you're talking about, well, cars, how do we look at this? The ideal thing is just to pay cash. Yep. If we know it's depreciating, how do you keep yourself from going underwater? The ideal answer is to pay cash. But I'm gonna, I like giving that advice that let's just pay cash. But I also know I've been 20 before. I've been 25 before where, you know, I wasn't getting paid completely what I was worth because I was getting an education at mm -hmm. work. Plus, I was putting in my time so that, you know, income could go yep. up. And, you know, you get married, you get a mortgage, and you're like, 
I just don't have a lot of money laying around, but I got to have good, dependable transportation yep. to get me there. What, what's, do you have some rules for people who can't pay cash? Yep. So we came up with some rules for people who can't pay, who cannot pay cash. That makes me sound smarter. No, I think I like, I, it, I like it when you use the word can't. can't. Sc- say can't. It definitely brings out can, the, the Can we make sure Georgia. that can't makes its way into the show notes? <laughs> awesome. Thank you. <laughs> but you can see, and we talked about this before, is that we want to come up with some, some tested rules that protect you from getting underwater, but also making sure your eyes aren't bigger than your wallet. Yep. And then you also, something we, a concept we talked about, don't price yourself outside of happiness. Yeah, that's right. By, by just buy, stop buying something to flex. Yep. And so we, here's what we put together. And this is non-luxury vehicles. Mm-hmm. If you're looking at BMWs, if you're looking at Teslas, Mercedes, this, Mercedes, Audi, this is not the slide for you. That's right. We're talking about Hondas, Toyotas. Toyota. We're talking about getting you from point A to point B where you know when you put the key in or push the button, it's cranking. That's right. So this is what we're talking about. You go put down 20%. You go amortize. You go calculate your monthly payments as a three-year amortization. 36 months. Now, I'm willing to let you actually take the 48-month offer, mm-hmm. but you're planning on making those payments on a three-year basis. That's right. Yep. Just do it because that way you never get underwater with this asset and then a depreciating asset. And then your car payment should never exceed 8% of your total income. Oh, that's great, Brian. So that means that I can go out and buy a car uh, and so long as the car payment for my car is not more than 8% and the car payment for a wife is not more than 8%. Is that what you're that saying? That would be nice. But if you think about it, that would actually mean 16% of your money, of your cash flow is going towards Auto loans. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about as a household. I don't want that number to see, so see, all exceed debt, 8%. Sir, so, so if I'm going to buy a new car, but my spouse still owes debt on their car, you gotta take I have to account. factor that into account. You can't just start over. Because remember, I'm trying to protect you. Society is already telling you this thing is your flex vehicle to show everybody how well you're doing, but it's actually an enemy to your financial That's statement right. and your net worth. So we've got to give you the tools to keep this under check so that you, I promise, yourself 10 to 15 years from now will thank yourself so that when you go speak to high schools and they say, what car do you drive? You're like, you guys got it all wrong. That's right. Don't worry about what car I drive. You need to know how big my net worth statement is. Now, here's the one aside, and this is just because of the unique environment that we've just come through. Interest rates have been at a historical low level. And 0.9, a lot of, 1.9. A lot of uh, auto dealerships have offered exactly what you said, 0.9% financing, 1.9%, 2.9%. It becomes a little bit different when you think about the equity risk premium versus an auto loan because an auto loan is a, an automobile is a depreciating asset, getting lower and lower in value. So we think that a nice rule of thumb of whether you should finance or should pay cash is less than 3% interest. If you can go get a 0.9, 1.9% loan, yeah, maybe you stretch it out over three years, pay that off. It's really more of a personal preference at that point. The big key is to make sure that you stay inside the 23.8. And then the last thing, because we, we hinted at it, but we didn't actually say it out loud and we have it on the slide. If you're buying, because there are a group of you that are looking at luxury vehicles. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're now like I am. I'm in my mid-40s. I've got a lot of the financial goals checked off and I see this nice shiny Tesla with all the gizmos in it, the video games that they keep upgrading, the fart sounds it makes, all the funny things you know that, that goes into making a Tesla experience a Tesla experience. You can buy this car if you've gone through your checklist and you can pay it off same as cash 12, 12 months. months. Love it. So when you buy luxury cars, I want you to treat it like you're paying cash and pay it off within 12 months. Absolutely love it. So this brings to the final drum roll moment. The thing that we've done, ask money guys on. We've mentioned it in shows and we keep having people come back to us and I call them debt crusaders. Right. These are people who have helmets on, they've got their chest plate on and they are just beating us with their clubs saying, you pay debt off no matter what. I don't care if you got a three and a half percent mortgage. I don't care if you have a 4% mortgage. I don't care if you're 22 years old. You get out of debt completely before you start letting that army of dollar bills work. And look, if you don't believe us, if you don't take our word for it, go look in the YouTube comments. Go look below. You're going to see it. We'll, we'll even throw some up on the screen for you. There are folks out there who just think no debt, no way, no how, got to get rid of it. So we felt like, okay, well, if people really think that way, we got to answer this. We got to speak well, to them about and this And I feel like stuff. it's friendly fire. If you guys knew my personal life, I'm not a person that loves debt. I mean, I don't. I pay off my credit cards every month. All my vehicles are owned. There's no student loan debt. And then I have a mortgage 
that will be paid off within 10 years. Love it. I mean, I did, it's just, and I've had, by the way, in my past, I've had 15 year mortgages. I've had 30 year mortgages. I am all for prepaying your debt. So I'm an ally of yours. I'm not a person, this is friendly fire when you're beating on Brian, the money guy, or Bo, because it, it, it's just, we're on your side. My biggest point, and we, this is why we wanted to bring up the numbers in a second, is that when you're in your 20s, when you're in your 30s, there is a special, special moment that you need to capitalize on. Remember, we've done shows where we've said a 20-year-old, every dollar they invest in themselves for the future could be worth $88 at right. 65. That is powerful. Because yep. realize, when you're 30 years old, every dollar you can invest in yourself has the potential to probably turn it into $23. There is a big slide from 88 to 23. Yep. It's still having a 23 multiplier factor is incredible, but it's a lot different from that 20 year old. So it breaks my heart when I hear a 25 or a 30 year old that says, I'm not going to invest yet. I'm going to wait until I get completely out of debt. And, and, and they normally set it up pretty well because if I get out of debt really soon, I can save more for the future for a longer period of time. That's, That's exactly because they, they say, I promise I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going to put that money to work so I can invest even more in the future because I'll be debt free. Yeah. That's what's presented. And here's the second thing I think, and this is wrong. We actually had one of our Ramsey Solutions family members yeah. reach out to us and say, guys, I love you guys, but y'all didn't do Dave right because you got the baby steps all wrong. Okay. Because you made it sound like Dave is telling you to pay off all debt and then invest. And we all know, and I, I was like, you know what? She's right. So step, if you look at baby step number four. These are Dave Ramsey, seven baby Dave steps. Dave Ramsey, because realize Dave Ramsey is the slayer of debt. I mean, we have people, I'll say, quit using your credit card. You got to pay it off monthly. And they're like, nah. And then you check with them. You're like, man, they are still spending a lot of money and they're still using credit right. cards in the wrong way. And then they go do financial peace, and he puts them on fire. It's unbelievable. I mean, it really is amazing what he can do for them. But, so I want to make sure people, because I think that's what happens. Dave gets these people out of debt. It feels so good because there is a psychological just release mm -hmm. that I am debt-free. So if it feels so good to pay off my credit cards, let's just keep this train rolling and ride into paying off our mortgage debt. That's not what Dave is telling you to do. Because if you look, baby step number four is invest 15% of income into Roth IRAs and pre-tax retirement plans. Right. So he wants that's you four. to be saving. He wants you to be saving 15% early on in the baby steps. So that's after you get through one, two, and three. Yep. We'll talk about that in an upcoming show. Sure. But number four is you are going to eventually start investing. And then guess what number six? Six does come after four is because it's four, which is invest the 15% of income into the future mm -hmm. retirement yep. accounts. Five is essentially do college savings for the kids. Six is pay off your home early. So Dave does say start saving before you start prepaying So Debt Crusaders, once again, friendly fire. I think you're getting your order of operations messed up and we got the number. So, so hit them with the facts, Bo. <laughs> Unload that thing. <laughs> So here, look at, tell them what we got here. Set them up. So we're going to talk about two different savers. We're going to look at two 30-year-olds, and they're both going to buy a house, right? Uh, they're going to buy a house for $300,000, and they're going to put 20% down because they don't want to pay PMI, uh, yeah. primary mortgage insurance. What's their good savers? They're, this is tale of two good savers. Tale of two good savers. Uh, they each have a 4% mortgage rate, and that seems pretty reasonable given where we are today. Um, I think it's interesting the two guys... What, what, were the what was the names you came up for them? You, you actually named our two case studies here, right? Well, I, I had one that was, um, what are those? Leisure, Leisure, Leisure Larry. Leisure Suit Larry. Leisure Larry, who's the, the boring saver. And then we had um, old, the, the old Debt Crusader. Old Stashy. Yeah, I mean, old, old Stash McGee. Old Colonel Stash, Stash McGee, McGee is what I there. called him. Okay, so this is what's going to happen. Uh, the guy with the stash, he is going to pay stash off... Stash McGee. Stash McGee. Debt crusader. He's a debt crusader. He's going to pay off his mortgage. He's writing the, YouTube comments left and right that Brian's an idiot for investing anything. He is going to pay off his mortgage in the first 10 years as quickly as he can. So he's going to go get a mortgage, paid off in 10 years, and he's going to pay $2,430 per month on his mortgage, and that's going to have it paid off. After it's paid off, starting at 10 years and one month, 
he's gonna start investing $2,430 a month, and he's gonna do that all the way until he hits age 65. Yep. So he's gonna be invested, he's gonna get that debt paid off, and he's gonna start saving more, just like a lot of our debt crusaders say. He is squeezing every opportunity. He's gonna attack that debt, that's his game plan. Attack that debt, and then after he pays off the debt, we're just gonna save like no one else and keep that momentum right. going. So then there is boring leisure suit Larry. So what he's gonna do is he's gonna amortize his mortgage he's over 30 years. He's a ladies years. man based upon that leisure suit he he's is, wearing. You he can just tell. He is a stud for sure. <laughs> Uh, he's going to pay off, uh, pay $1,146 per month on his mortgage, but he's going to invest the difference of $1,284. So if you just add those two up, it equals what uh, Stashy's mortgage payment was going to be. And look, I, I will tell you, I don't think the average person is probably going to be in their mortgage for all 30 years. Right, sure. But to prove our point, we're just going to say that old Leisure Suit Larry here is going to pay his mortgage not a penny faster than though it is on his amortization yep. schedule. So this is going to be 30 years, but then he's, and it, that math works out. Look at 2430 a month, which is the debt crusader is going to pay it off. Subtract that from the calculated amortization payment of 1146 yep. You'll see that's where we came up with how much is going to be invested, a little under $1,300 a month. But remember what we said early is that the dollars you save are not equal. Early dollars can do more for you than later dollars. So this is what we assume. They're 30 years old. We assume that money they save in their 30s is going to make 9%, and then their 40s are going to make 8%, and then their 50s are going to make 7%, and then their 60s are going to make 6%. So we didn't even try to stack the, de the deck in our favor. We're actually subscribing to exactly what we say is a realistic expectation. Yeah, because I think... It because notice we have 30 year olds here. Yep. If we would have pushed this to the 20, say a 25 year old and pushed that rate of return up to 10%, it doesn't get better for the debt crusader. Right. I will just go ahead and let that spill the beans on that a little bit. Bo, go ahead and hit them up with some more details. So this is what we see. If you look at the top illustration, this is the debt crusader. After 10 years, they are mortgage free. They debt free. Are debt free. Woo free and clear. And then they start investing and they do a great job. And because they are fantastic savers, because by the time they get to age 65, they would have $1,954,039. Yep. Which is fantastic. It's a great, it's a healthy portfolio. They're going to be all right. But if you're someone out there who's trying to optimize what you're doing, look at what happens for Boring Investor. So Boring Investor, you can see those lines don't, it's not like it takes it to zero on the debt right. in 10 years and then they start investing. There's actually, you start investing from day one. Yep. The debt's slowly coming down, very slowly, because this person's not paying a penny extra on their mortgage, which I don't recommend that, but I'm just trying to prove my point. Very slowly paying down the debt. But look at what happens with that compounding interest is that money as a 30-year-old, what it's making that 9%. That's exactly right. And then 40-year-old, he's making 8%. And it just keeps compounding. Go, You can see at the end of it, and I don't want to give the full reveal until we go to the next slide. So sure. flip it over one more page. Look at this. So we started this. It starts off at after 10 years. We've yep. got the debt crusader on the left. So sure enough, 10 years into it, he's debt-free but his investment balance is zero because right. he used every bit of his resources to get out of debt from age 30 to 40 years of age. Yep. At 10 years, he was attacking that debt. That boring investor, after 10 years, his mortgage balance that started at $240,000 was now paid down to $189,000. Yep. But he still got debt. He still he got does it. have debt, but his investments is worth 250 grand. If you look at the difference between the debt he has outstanding, the mortgage balance, and what the investments are worth, He's $61,000 net worth. Yep. If you take your assets minus your liabilities, you see your net worth. That's $61,000 ahead of the debt crusader. What I love about this illustration is after 10 years, if Boring Investor said, you know what, I'm just ready to be done with this mortgage, he actually has enough in his investment account that he could write a check to pay off the mortgage. Well, that's a good, because I had some people, one of those comments you posted up there is somebody said, I'm paying off my mortgage early, so in case I lost my job, right. I would, I would, you know, I'm going to be on an easy street because I'm debt free. I would tell you, you're going to feel better if you lose your job, if you have a tank of money over here that you can go pull That's off right. of to pay bills with. Because the problem with mortgage debt is I hate that it's hard to get it out. It's a one way street unless you go open up a home equity line. Yep. You got to go get more debt to get the money back out. It's, it goes in and then you basically have an army of dollar bills that instead of out there working for you and compounding and growing, they're once again disassembling their, their you know, cleaning their, their guns. Their gun, they're cleaning their guns, they're polishing their boots, and they're going, 
why am I locked up here in this house when I could be out there growing? Because remember, the house that you bought, this $300,000 with $240,000 of debt, if it's appreciating at 3 or 4%, they're both appreciating they're both at 3 or 4%. Percent. It doesn't matter how much mortgage debt is on right. there. The house is still appreciating. Yep. So let's go ahead and look at 20 years into it. 20 years into it, the debt crusader, I give him credit. He is saving, and he's saving just like he said he was going to be. He's very disciplined. And now his his hard work has created a portfolio that's worth close to a little under half a million that's dollars, right. $447,000. But look at that boring investor. 20 years into this, he still has $113,000 of credit card, I mean of mortgage, uh, mortgage debt. debt. But now his investments are worth $792,000. If you took the difference between those two things, you can see we come out ahead. If you take the difference between 792, the 113, and then subtract that from the 447, the guy who was the boring investor is still $231,000 ahead of schedule. Uh, here's what I think is still just absolutely wonderful. If after 20 years, this boring investor said, you know what? I'm done with my mortgage debt. I'm going to write a check for $113,000 and pay it off. He would still have more in his investment account balance and zero debt than the debt crusader. No, this he's, isn't he's going to get better. flexibility on his side. So 30 years, I thought this was interesting. A year, 30 years into it, we know what happened. 30 years, now the boring investor, he's paid off his 30-year mortgage. So his investments are worth $1.8 million at this point. The debt crusader is worth $1.3. We're looking at a $493,000 difference. Oh, that's, a, that's a huge percentage yep. of what we're talking about. Then we fast forward to full retirement age at 65. 35 years into it, you can see the debt crusaders at $1.9 million. The boring investors, 2.6. This does not get better. It, wh why does this matter? You can just do some really simple math. Pull out your phone, pull out your calculator. We talk about all the time that when you retire, you can think about a healthy withdrawal rate, depending on your age, somewhere between 35 to 5%. 3.5% to 5% of $1.9 million is very different than 35 to 5% this, of $2.6 million. This could be a $30,000 a year difference on your cash flow in right. retirement. That's, That's exactly huge right. if you just did a 5% withdrawal rate. So guys, I want you to be debt free. I just want you to respect when you're in your 20s and 30s, you're in a special period of your life right. where the army of dollar bills, the potential for them is tremendous. I mean, this works another way too. If you're wasteful with your spending, if you're not mm -hmm. paying attention to set that army of dollar bills to save 10, 15, 20, 25% of your money to work for you, you're missing out on a huge opportunity right. to invest and let that money work for you so you can live like no one else while you're young, but then live like no one else when you're older Love because it. you have true financial independence. Okay, that's great. What did we leave unturned here, Bo? I, I think we know it. Look, we, and, and here's here's what we understand. Some folks just want to be debt free. Some people they get close to age 65 or close to age 6, and they're going to retire, and they say, you know what? I've got the means. I'm going to pay off my mortgage. Okay, if you've put yourself in a position where you can do that and it doesn't sacrifice your future financial security, that's great. We're not saying that you have to only pay off a mortgage in 30 years because frankly, you're not even in a situation where you're going to do that. Yeah. It's just a matter of getting your order of operations correct or getting your baby steps correct to make sure you're doing them in the right time, in the right order. You, you bring up a good point because I don't want to be a, person, a hypocrite when I'm doing something different. And this ties into Carter and I had a discussion. Carter's been on the show before. He's one of our associates. One of his clients, who's also a money guy family member, was talking about paying down the debt early. And I will tell you, I think that there is a, because this is the question, Carter and I had a whole conversation on it. And I, he told me that he had a client that was going to go ahead and pay down. I said, well, what is he saving towards his future? He goes, oh, he's at 25%. I said, well, wait a minute. If he's, if he's already saving 25%, I'm not going to fault a person. Mm -hmm. You heard like Dave in his baby step number four said he wants you saving 15% to retirement. I would amend that and try to nudge that number up to 20 to 25%. Right. But I'm not going to pick on somebody, even though the numbers support what I'm telling you. If you're saving 20 to 25% for the future and you're in your 20s or 30s, I'm not going to fault you if you want to have the best of both worlds where you're Order of operations, you're investing in that army of dollar bills in, in, in the future by actually investing the yep. money. But if you want to come back and prepay that debt, 
I get it. Yep. I mean, because there are some huge emotional benefits to being debt-free. There's also, you are dialing down your total risk to what's going on That's in the right. world with employment and market. So I get that. Just make sure you get this order of operations and that every dollar has a purpose. I want you to be that good field general that every dollar that comes into your possession, that you're in charge, that you're responsible for, that you actually maximize it, yep. that you put some thought into it. And, and that's why I'm saying it's friendly fire. We're on the same page. We want you to be debt free. We just want to make sure that we get you there in the best, most efficient way possible. If you love this, if you love the content that we covered, if you love some of the deliverables or some of the uh, slides that we shared, make sure you go out to our website, moneyguy.com. Give us your email address. We're actually going to send some of these things out so that you guys can see them, chew on them, maybe share them with family, friends, loved ones. We want this to be something that's going to be a tool for you. But the only way to get it is you have to go to the website, moneyguy.com and give us your email address. We can yeah, get no cap. These are going to be the tools that get you to that next level. And that leads me, a lot of you guys, you're watching this go, man, they really put some thought into this. Mm -hmm. I can tell this is something that they cared enough that maybe we disagree, but at least, at least these guys didn't use emotion. They tried to give me some facts and figures. Guys, this is what we do. We love, this is our online classroom where I want you to come learn, apply, grow, become super successful. We call that the abundance cycle because my thought is, Having these type of discussions with you where you're getting stronger, better, and just having an understanding of how money works, you're going to reach a point where you go, I'd like somebody to look over my shoulder. Or, this is getting so big. I need somebody that's going to be my partner in this. That's when you're going to reach out to us. Yep. That's the abundance cycle. So you're going to give us a chance to pay it forward and pay us back for all these years of content by reaching out at aboundwealth.com or moneyguy.com and going to a contact us. We work with clients all across the country. We love giving away free advice, but we do hope that at some point we can take it to the next level and turn you from listener, fan of the Money Guy Show, into hopefully becoming part of the Abound family. Love it. Guys, we have a blast. I, this was so much fun. I've been giddy. I woke up at 4.30 this morning because I knew we were recording two shows yep. today. This type of stuff it wakes me up not in fear, but in excitement. I'm like a kid waiting for you know Christmas morning and opening presents. I love presenting this type of content to you guys because I just know there's going to be some of you guys, you're going to disagree with me, but there's going to be a whole other group that's going to say, I appreciate that you put the numbers into it. And maybe I'm thinking about this a little differently because I watched your show. So that just warms my heart. And I could not have done this. We've been doing this since 2006. A long time. Couldn't do it without you guys. You guys are the rocket fuel that have motivated us and kept it going. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So make sure you give us you know, the thumbs up, subscribe for notifications on YouTube, but then also just make sure you're telling your friends and family and we will keep the content coming. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, moneyguy.com. We'll come to you again soon.